All right. Um, so we'd we'll like to welcome you to uh, the webinar here on, uh, on desperate times, not desperate measures, um, all about this idea of, uh, of hiring church workers uh, in various ways. I, I, I know we, uh, maybe a lot of you are looking for workers right now in, in non-traditional ways. Um, well, as of last Friday, um, the Minnesota South District had 27 open positions for a teacher and five for administrators. I think last year at this time, it was 22. So that should give you an idea of the direction things are going. Um, lots of administrators out there, probably many of you on right now or, or uh uh, members of call committees, perhaps, that are wondering, how are we going to fill these positions? And maybe that's why you're here right now. Um, if, if you missed last week's uh, webinar on the laborers are few, mm -hmm. um, the recording link are going to be sent out to everyone who registered either last week or this week. It doesn't matter. Um, I think it will be sent out either tomorrow or within the next two days. Um, so that you can watch that or rewatch that if you uh, missed any of the information. Um, but Beth is back. Um, part two. <laughs> um, Beth is back to present on Desperate Times, Desperate Measures. Um, so we're blessed to have Beth back with us, and we're blessed to have a, a partner with Concordia Plans who is providing these webinars. So uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, we praise and thank you for our workers. We are blessed to have uh, blessed to have them in our schools and our ministries. Um, we're we're blessed to have a partner in Concordia Plans. Um, we're blessed to have Beth providing our webinar today. Please bless this message. May it provide answers for our leaders, for our workers, for our ministries. Um, Lord, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Therefore, Lord, we pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, Beth, it's all yours. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to start off a little non-traditional. I want to tell you a little bit of a horror story, a hiring horror story, and how I started to help. I started, um, I came from corporate America. I actually started my career in um, Humana, and uh, so I have an HR background. And I started to help in the nonprofit space, even before I was hired with Concordia Plans and um, kind of helping with them because I had a honey favor. And uh, I call it, it's called a honey favor because it was my husband and he calls me honey. No one else can do that. But honey, would you please, right? Could you please go HR for free? Well, he had a friend um, who he had gone to school with. My husband was, before he was a pastor, was a, a, a Lutheran school teacher. And then he actually was a Lutheran school principal. And he had a friend who was at another um, uh, ministry, not an LCMS ministry. I'm going to use some examples today uh, throughout the training. And I've purposely changed names or I'm using ones from um, Catholic schools or non-denoms and other ones I've helped with because we're a small Lutheran body. But anyway, he said, would you please help with this, this situation? They're, they're really in a pickle. So they had this teacher that they had hired. It was not um, a new teacher by any stretch of the imagination. She'd been teaching for more than a decade, it said, according to her resume brand new to the school, first year in the school. And he said, I've got kids. This is my husband's friend, not my husband. That um, uh, kids that have not been problem kids complaining and crying to come to school, um, kind of pillars of the ministry um, at this Nandana, uh, very ad huge advocates for the school. We're going to pull their kids all because of one specific teacher. And so he said, will you help? They don't have a budget. They need help with the HR space. And so what was going on is they had a teacher they had hired. It's the first year. It's first semester. Uh, parents are complaining that the grading of papers are being um, like randomly graded, like answers are wrong. They're marked right. Answers are right. They're marked wrong. So there's no rhyme or reason. Um, this teacher has been caught on social media and watching YouTube videos instead of lesson planning. The kids are falling behind. And then um, a lot of uh, inconsistent treatment of the different students. Um, and then also um, screaming and, and not using that word lightly, but actually physically raising her voice for pretty nominal issues for a second or third grade class. Can't remember if it was a second or third grade, third grade class. Um, to the point where the principal had put him on a written warning and said, you know, here's our discipline process and da 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 da. And if there's discipline, you need to get it to me. So anyway, what 
it came to a head as the principal said, you know, hey, I, uh, I, I was supposed to go on a field trip and I ran back into the school and I, I heard her screaming all the way across the hall at some kid because they'd sharpened their pencil. And so um, they're really, they were really in a pickle. And so they'd had this teacher less than four months. Um, and it basically was just about to blow up the school and the ministry. Again, not one of our LCMS ministries, but something we can learn from it. Um, that teacher was not engaged. They were not engaged with what they were doing. They were not engaged with their ministry. And um, hiring staff is so critical that you're hiring people that are engaged. Um, the engagement level of your employees absolutely helps or hinders your organization. It affects your ministry, your name and your brand in the community, your team dynamics, the communities you serve, your students. And to be honest, for you all as administrators, it affects you because you got to deal with it. You got to deal with the aftermath and, and um, all the interpersonal conflict that comes in. So hiring the right person for the right role is a critical component to drive engagement. Um, and it is sparse. Um, Sean mentioned Minnesota South, you're seeing an increase in the number of people who um, uh, or have vacancies at their ministries. If you look at the demographics in the LCMS, uh, we are hiring more and more lay teachers. So it's really important that we are um, confident when we are hiring because sometimes we wanna put someone in um, uh, into a position and we wanna make sure we're not doing damage. All right, I'm just gonna quick um, hide my video and flip here on my screen. This is, as Sean said, one of a three-part series um, all of the sessions are being recorded. So if you have registered, it's not too late. If you missed the first one, they're going to send that out. Or if you have um, other people um, near your ministry that you think would benefit from this, you can go ahead and send that out after the fact. Uh, last week, I talked about what to do when you can't find candidates and how to increase your candidate pool. So you are getting more people to apply for your open positions. Um, a lot of them were low budget ideas of how to expand your net and where to go. Um, this week, I'm going to be talking about behavioral-based interviewing and kind of um, looking for red flags in the pre-screening and interviewing processes. And then I'll, I'll um, shore it up with just some don't forgets, uh, things to do to protect your ministry at the end. And the next week is going to be closing the deal. And so really the thought behind this whole series is how do you attract people? How do you um, keep them engaged to the interview process so you're not losing out on candidates? And then how do you close the deal? And, and how do you make confident hiring decisions? Um, so yeah, so with that example, um, that situation, the first nonprofit I volunteered to help at, um, part of the biggest problem with that nonprofit is they were losing about half their staff that year. And so they probably just didn't take the diligence they normally do when they hire. Um, they had two people who were retiring that were married together and were moving out of state. They had another person that decided it would be a good time to leave because they're going to switch out a principal. And so, um, and then they had one other person that was vacant. I don't remember what the third vacancy is, but I think they were a staff about eight or nine and about four people were leaving and they were a little panicky to hurry up and fill the positions. Um, also looking at that situation, some of the people had never actually interviewed before and didn't have a lot of structure in that process. And so I'm gonna use that example and I'm gonna use some other examples. Keep in mind, I've changed names and situations a little so you can't figure out who they are. If it is within the LCMS, this specific example is not. Um, just as we go through so that you can learn from those examples. Um, there, the behavioral based interviewing is what's called a structured interview where you have actual forms. Um, you think about the questions ahead of time and are very purposeful with how you ask questions of candidates and then how you assess them. There's a way you can document how you're assessing candidate to candidate. And so it's a very, very specific structured way to interview. It is double the validity rate compared to unstructured interviews. So it's it's a it's a process that's been around in corporate America for over 30 years. Um, it's one that I have personally seen um, employers save hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on, on not having bad hires. And so one that I, I have advocated for over the course of my career. And um, the other thing is because it is structured, if you are ever challenged uh, from a discriminatory hiring perspective, it is much easier to defend because you have that documentation. So that's what we're going to do today. So our agenda today is I'm going to introduce you to behavioral based interviewing, um, I'm going to go over some interviewing techniques, probing, and looking for red flags. We'll talk about some ways to mitigate risk. And then I'm going to share with you some take-home resources for attending this session. Um, uh, and uh, this is going to be a quick 
um, it's a quick overview. Some, some, some of the training courses for behavioral based interviewing can be hours in length. Um, I've cut out the practicing. So if you have any questions after, I will give you my contact information at the end of the, today's session. And some of those resources I'm going to give you at the end, you don't have to recreate the wheel. There's some that I've written specifically for um, education and you're able to use them. So before I go into behavioral based interviewing and how to do um, that type of question in an interview, I want to talk about what you need to do before the interview and namely you need to pre screen. So before you ever schedule an interview, you really want to take 15 to 20 minutes and you spend time on the phone with a candidate before you bring them in for an interview. You don't want to have the emotional connection or investment in time with your hiring committee or with the candidate if they're just not going to be a fit for what you're looking for. Um, last week's session, I did talk about things you need to know. I'm going to go through this kind of quick because I, I think I see some of the same names here about the things you should know um, when you post a position. And that's because when you get to to the pre-screen, you're probably going to need to talk about it. So that could be what you're looking for, for the role. Maybe you need someone with a skill set to teach a specific class. Um, maybe you want to find a, a skill set that's complementary to something that's missing on your team. Uh, you need to know the salary range and benefit information in the pre-screen. It doesn't do your ministry any good for you to spend your valuable time bringing someone in for an hour long interview and just to find out at the end that they want $30,000 more than you're willing to pay and they aren't going to budge. So you just want to spend the 15, 20 minutes talking about that. I'm talking about role expectations too. Say you're bringing an administrative assistant, making sure that they understand uh, what the expectations are for that. And then just talking to them about the process, the timeline participants um, and things of that nature. Um, some specific things that I do in the pre-screen is an open-ended question. So I'm just gonna start off like, hey, tell me a little bit about why you wanna be a teacher. Tell me about why you wanna work for our ministry. Um, you're really trying to get them to be at ease so they just feel comfortable and you're kind of feeling them out a little bit at this point with the pre-screen. Um, you're going to look for what's called motivational fit. And motivational fit is just a fancy way to say why do they want to come work for you or why do they want that position. And that could mean if I'm hiring someone, um, I say, well, why do you want to work here? And they say, it's a job. I need a job versus I'm really passionate about spreading the gospel or I am in public school and I want to be able to share my faith and I just cannot do that. Or um, perhaps uh, you're hiring an administrative uh, professional and they say, well, I don't like sitting all day. I don't like constant interruptions. So I'm looking to leave my current employer. And that's helpful for you to know, because if that's what they're going to expect in your ministry or in interruptions and sitting for most of the day, then you need to know that it's part of that motivational fit. So those are some of the things that I'm kind of asking a little bit about more questions. Um, I'm going to look at their work history. If you have an application or they gave you a resume, I'm going to look at both of those to make sure that they're consistent. If they have um, a LinkedIn that they've um, uh, put on their resume or application, I'm going to look at that before I call them. And I'm going to look for any gaps of work history. And I'm also going to look at uh, if there's any inconsistencies between LinkedIn and the resume or the application, because I'm going to talk through that with that candidate. I'm going to say, you know, walk me through your work history. And then I'm going to ask about, you know, hey, why did you leave that employer? Why are you looking to leave your current employer? Why do you want to work here? And then I am going to talk salary. I'm not going to necessarily guarantee what they're going to make, but I should be going over either here's the range we're willing to pay or we're able to pay, or here's how we come up with the range. And we're usually at between this number and this number, or do you have a minimum salary expectation? And especially if they're coming from public school, it could look a little different coming over to our um, LCMS schools. So you just want to make sure that you're having that conversation. So again, you're not spending an hour to two hours in an interview committee with multiple people and they're not able to um, take something like that. And then make sure that they understand the duties, the, the number of hours, um, what they're going to be doing, what the culture is like a little bit um, there. So that's kind of the pre-screen. Um, now I'm going to talk about a little bit deep dive on, on top 10 resume pre-screen red flags that I look for. So if you've only got a few slides of this whole presentation, this is the one that I would maybe take notes on and make sure because these are the biggest ones. And that scenario I told you about at the beginning of um, the session with Shirley and my husband's friend at the non-denom, 
Um, I saw the resume and within seconds, because I have a trained eye, I knew that there would probably have been red flags that they they didn't vet out. So I'm pretty passionate about looking for red flags. Uh, the quote I always say is, if you look at a person with rose colored glasses, you can never see any of their red flags. So number one is job hopping or recent longevity is short. If you're looking to hire someone, you want someone to stay so you have some consistency with your programs. Um, I look at their their history, and if they were at a job for 15 years, and then the last five jobs were all one year, you want to heavily weigh their recent jobs because that's the pattern that they're on. They're probably not going to stay long term. Um, job hopping is much more common right now in America where people are switching, but think about it from an industry perspective if you're seeing any anomalies. It is still... Um, while people may change employers in the teaching world, it is not normal to switch uh, 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 schools every single year, especially if it's not within the same school district. So that's a huge red flag. That example I shared at the beginning, um, that is one of the giant red flags that I saw is that that person was a teacher for over 10 years. And in 10 years, I think they had nine different schools. Um, that were not part of the same system. They were just completely switching schools, um, a Catholic school, a non-denom, a daycare. I mean, they were all over the board. So that was one of the giant red flags that I saw. That's not really normal in education. Now, not to say if their spouse is maybe in the military or they're moving around, but you'd want to ask, you know, why have they switched so many times or kind of really flush that out before you come into the interview. And um, other thing I'm looking for is dishonesty and inconsistencies in their dates and reason leaving. So I looked at their LinkedIn, I looked at the application, I looked at the resume. If I see that they don't have any employment for 18 months or six months or a couple of weeks, I'm going to ask, you know, what were they doing in that time? Did they have any gaps? I'm going to try to figure out if it makes sense. I'm going to ask why they left other employers and some and I'm going to document that too because sometimes what they tell you in the pre-screen, they forget and then they tell you a different reason in the interview. And I just want to make sure I flush that out. Um, I don't want someone to quit a current employer or tell me they've left other employers only to find that the position I'm hiring them for is still going to be the same problem. So let me give you an example. Um, I hired someone who said, I really am stressed out dealing with the public. I don't want to work with people. Um, but they were applying for an administrative assistant position. That was like a front desk receptionist. They'd be answering the phone. They'd be having lunch. That's not a fit for that person. So I'm going to listen to what that person says and say, you know, that's that's maybe not going to work. Um, I'm going to look for career or role changes that don't make sense. So another example at a different school um, was I had a principal who then moved down to a teaching position at a different school. And then they switched schools again and they were a principal. And then they moved to a teacher position within that school. And then they switched schools again, and now they're a teacher. So now they're applying for a principal. I'm going to ask, that's not a normal career progression to kind of ping pong or to go from principal to teacher. I'm going to wonder, maybe that principal position, maybe they weren't ready for it. Maybe it wasn't a fit. They didn't. It wasn't what they thought. Maybe they were demoted or it wasn't working out. But I'm going to, um, I'm going to really probe and ask more questions when I see stuff like that. Um, the example I used at the way beginning for Shirley, another example that I saw um, on there was she was a teacher and she left mid-semester and worked at Walmart. That would not be normal. Usually you'd finish out the school year. Um, they didn't ask. Um, I, I inquired with um, the gentleman that was the principal and he said he just he wasn't sure what he could ask. And so they kind of didn't and they were hiring so many people and in retrospect, they probably could. Um, but that was a, that's unusual to leave in the middle of the year and then went to go work at a Walmart. So clearly something happened at that employer, but they don't know what that she was. She wasn't even there a full year. Um, I call it bad mouthing, but speaking ill of former employers or leaders, um, everybody can vent. But if you've got someone that's got that rain cloud and they're really negative about previous experiences, usually that rain clouds following the person. And so that might be part of um, that they may be hard to please, um, but if they're very, very negative about a lot of other employers or leaders, I would caution you as, as that could be a red flag and, and generally um, is, is hard for morale for the rest of your staff. Um, if all of their references are personal or they're not recent, that's another red flag for me. Um, if you're hiring a, a brand new teacher, maybe right out of college, 
Um, they should still be able to give you professional references, maybe from a part-time job. I would take a reference from there. Um, if they volunteered somewhere, maybe they teach Sunday school at their church, the pastor could give a reference or they volunteered at the YMCA to coach soccer. Um, you could take a reference from a former uh, college professor, but they should have non-personal, like non-friends uh, or family references. Um, it is okay if they don't have references from their current employer, if they're confident, uh, confidentially trying to apply to leave an employer, that would be normal. But if they can't say, give you any other references that are, you know, from anyone more, you know, within the last couple of years, that would be a red flag. Um, if there are missing jobs on the resume or application, I would probe that. Um, sometimes on a resume, if I'm if I'm applying for a teaching position, I may just have educational experiences, and maybe I don't have like my part time job waiting tables at the restaurant. Um, that that is normal. That is fine um, as long as um, you know they can speak to that. But if they are missing an employer that maybe they were a teacher at, especially for part of the year, or there's a gap, I would question why it's not on the resume or application if it comes up. So I would just kind of watch for that. Um, another red flag is if they are currently employed and they tell you something like, "I can come in for an interview right away. I'll call in sick." Um, I've actually had people tell me that in the interview process, and that's a huge red flag because if they're going to do that to their current employer, um, they're going to do it to you. Um, also watch for people who are willing to quit their employers without any notice because, again, if they're willing to do that to their current employer, they're willing to do that to you. And so that is that's a red flag for me as well. Um, sometimes you will have individuals say that they were um, laid off or um, and sometimes laid off, uh, they really truly were a part of a staff reduction, but sometimes people receive a package, like a severance package, and so they assume it means they were laid off or that's how they state it to you. And so I always try to probe a little bit more when they say that they're laid off to make sure it truly was a layoff. So that example in the beginning, one of the employers that um, she had uh, left. She had said she was laid off. They gave her a package, but she wasn't laid off. They they filled her position. It, they just didn't, they didn't think she was a fit. So she was let go. Um, the other thing I look at for layoffs is nothing wrong if someone, sometimes that does happen where someone is part of a staff reduction, but if they're um, part of a staff reduction multiple times, and that's not common in that industry, um, that's a red flag. And so I'd kind of probe why were they maybe always selected or it, ask them if they know why they're selected. And um, if they were ever involuntarily separated, if you don't have a question on your application to ask if they've ever been involuntarily separated, if you think there are some circumstances why someone left and it seems kind of foggy about why they left, I just try to say, well, tell me more about why you left. Um, what, you know, was it voluntary? Was it involuntary? You can ask, you know, have you ever been asked to resign? Um, you know, tell me more about why you chose to leave and then just kind of be quiet. Um, and let them talk. And so people will generally kind of kind of share if you're if you're very nice and respectful to them, they'll share more information about that. Um, if they can't tell you why they left employers or the reasons don't make sense, I kind of push on that. And sometimes I'll have people be kind of quiet, like, well, I don't want to say or and I just will kind of say, you know, well, I want to make sure that this is a match for what you're looking for. And so it's always good for me to know the why, um, the why you left. So I will I will kind of look at um you know, at those reasons that they're telling me. And again, I'm matching it to the interview and I'm matching it with what they're seeing. And then the other thing is I'm going to look at um, a sloppy resume. If someone is applying for a position, um, I once had someone that I was looking at, um, a marketing manager was looking to hire someone for a marketing position when I, when I worked in corporate America and they wanted to hire this person and they had a lot of spelling and and, and um, grammar errors. And, you know, so like, I don't think that's the person I'd want for marketing. Just same as if they're going to communicate with parents and there's a lot of spelling and grammar and they're your English teacher, it just kind of seems like that's their best foot forward. Just kind of keep that in mind um, when you're looking at that. So those are my top 10 resume and pre-screen red flags. Again, um, those are the things I'm looking for uh, when I first am talking to someone. And you can do that first contact within 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, we're going to switch now to talk about behavioral-based interviewing because once I've pre-screened, I want to go through an interview process. I do recommend that you have an interview committee, um, more than one person. 
um, two or three is best because sometimes one of you will pick up on something and you can kind of tag team a little bit on questions. You don't miss stuff and you just get a more well-rounded view. And so um, I do recommend that you have a committee and that you train your hiring um, team on illegal questions that they can ask, uh, the skill set you're looking for. Um, and with that, um, the behavioral based interviewing will give you a packet even, but you basically you want to hire people that not only have the technical skills, so maybe they know how to teach, but they also have some soft skills, um, emotional intelligence and motivational fit. So you want to make sure that um, they're able to communicate with coworkers, that they can communicate well with parents. Um, that they can um, take direction, that maybe they, you need someone that can problem solve or step up. Um, you want someone that uh, wants to work for your ministry and what maybe is passionate about serving students. And so the methodology we use is called struct is structured behavioral based interviewing. And they can ask questions to hit all four of those components, the technical, soft, emotional skills and motivational fit. Um, with behavioral-based interviewing, the questions are structured to capture those core competencies. They're going to point to past performance as a predictor. So it's with behavioral-based interviewing, you're going to ask them to kind of tell you a story to kind of articulate the skill set. So you're going to say, tell me about a time when, or give me an example when. And the reason we do that is because um, past performance is the best way to indicate the future performance. Um, you're not going to generally ask hypothetical or yes and no questions. Um, you definitely want to learn from the ex example because you want to get meaty responses. And you want to structure questions that are open-ended and you want to probe to get the whole picture to understand the how and why. So give me some examples. Um, uh, and also, I'm sorry, um, that they're not generalized or theorized, meaning what would you do or generally what do you do? You want to know some specifics. You're going to learn much more about the candidate that way. So give me an example of questions and we'll get better and better. But the first one is, do you have fundraising experience? So we would want to know more than just a yes or no. So do you have fundraising experience really is not enough to get at uh, a media experience. So instead, you could ask, uh, you know, with, with other interviewing um, strategies, how many years of fundraising experience do you have? But that may not give you enough information either because you don't know the level. So you could have 10 years of the same one year of experience. Um, you don't want to ask hypothetical because they could kind of just make it up. If they've never done it before, they don't know. So if you ask, well, what would you do? They don't know your culture. Maybe they don't know how big and meaty those projects are that you might want to assign them. So the best way, if you wanted to know fundraising experience, would be uh, to flip it to have them tell you a story about their past experience. So for this one, you would say, tell me about a large fundraising experience you had. And from the answer the candidate's able to give you, you can also see what they even assess to be a large fundraising experience. So for example, um, instead of saying, well, I only have one or two years of fundraising experience, I can say, well, one fundraiser I, I ran was the school auction and I led that and it was $70,000 that brought into the school in that one event. So that would be a little bit more of a meaty example. Um, when you're writing a behavioral based interview question, again, you're flipping the question so that the candidate will tell you about a specific example that has happened in the past. You don't want, well, normally I do this or generally I do this. You want to flip it. And so you can do this with pretty much any one of your favorite questions that you have, or maybe there's a certain type of question you want. And you just rewrite it a little. So I have two examples here. Um, one is um, I had uh, an administrator that said, you know, they wanted to know basically how they encouraged coworkers to get along. They had some interpersonal dynamics on the team they're struggling with. And so the administrator said, well, if you had two co coworkers who weren't getting along, what would you do? Which is hypothetical. The better question and the structured question would be, tell me about a time when you had coworkers that weren't getting along. What did you do? And candidates are going to be more likely to give you an honest answer and more specifics about something that's happened in the past that's going to be easier for you to assess it. 
Um, another example that I flipped for this exam for this um, presentation is that a lot of administrators like are the questions of like, what are your top strengths? And it's not a bad question, but it does um, it does require the candidate to actually know what their strengths are and that they want to share with them with you. Sometimes they'll try to answer what they think you want to hear. So this is one common question I've seen a lot is what are your three strengths? And then let them tell you what they are, like people, leadership, public speaking, problem solving, whatever. And then you say, tell me an example of a time when you used one of those strengths at work. And so then you're kind of flipping it and kind of learning a little bit more about that. Um, the purpose of the behavioral-based interview question is that you are trying to get an answer from the candidate um, that has a full STAR. And STAR is the acronym that we use for behavioral-based interviewing to kind of get the whole scenario from the candidate. So the STAR stands for Situation, Task, Action, and Result. And if you want to get extra credit, sometimes people will ask, what did they learn or they reflected from a situation? But the situation is kind of where and when of the story they're telling you, they kind of set the scene. The task is what was that challenge or expectation that they needed to do? The action would be how did they approach the task or what tools or approach did they choose did they use others who were knowledgeable? Was it a team? Like basically how did they solve the problem or approach it? The result, which is the most common thing that I see in interviews people forget to get is the so what. So at the end of the day, were they successful? A lot of times I've had candidates and they tell me this story and then, well, how do you know you were successful and they can't articulate it? Or sometimes they've even said, well, I wasn't. And if they weren't, then I want to know, okay, well, let's switch to reflect then. What did you learn from that? Um, and then um, when you're talking about these examples, what I like to do with an interview is I like to tell the candidate, um, I'm going to do behavioral-based interviewing questions with you. And so instead of giving me general or general um, questions or general, res general responses, I'm going to tell that candidate, so when I ask you a question, I'm going to ask you for a very specific example, and I'll give you a few minutes to think about that example, and we'll be looking at, and then it's okay to say, like, what was the situation, what was your task, what did you do, and then what was the result, and I walk them through how to, that, how to do that, and I try to walk them through um, each example, so I know this is going a little fast because we only have like an hour to do the whole whole session, but I'm going to walk through a few examples with a situation, task, action, and result. And then in this middle column, I've got what was the context, the assignment, the what, and the end performance. So an example of this could be, tell me about a time if you're interviewing an administrator where you had to uh, revise a policy. And so the administrator would say, I was an administrator at a ministry and my handbook was outdated. So that's kind of their context or situation. And the assignment was the board asked them to revise their handbook over the year. And then, so then how did they do it? They broke it down policy by policy. They asked coworkers or peers, they looked on, online. And then the end result was we had it all updated by the end of the year. So the candidate is you wanting them to answer each component of this. They don't always state it to you um, in a narrative form, right in order. And so when you're collecting it, you'll collect it in your interview packet like this. And if they don't, if they forget to give you a component, then it kind of triggers you to remember to ask. So if I was the principal answering, well, I had to update my handbook. And um, I had to get it done by the end of the year and because the, the board wanted me to do it. And so if that was the answer the candidate said to me, I would know, well, what was the result? I didn't hear the result. Did you get it done on time? Was it done on budget? Um, how do you know it was accurate? So when you see the interview packets, which will be a deliverable from this, um, which will make a little more sense when you actually see it, you'll see it breaks out the interview questions and then you've got these boxes that you can kind of record each one of these sections of the star to make sure you have a full and complete example. Um, you'll see uh, it'll look just like this when you ask the when you when you I'm sorry, record the interview questions. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about in the behavioral or structured based interviewing is the importance of probing 
which is like peeling things back layer by layer, like an onion. So if that in that example, that principal that did the handbook um, that we just looked at, it would be asking more questions. Did you get it done on time? Did you get it done on budget? How do you know what you got was accurate? Why was it outdated? So you're kind of asking follow-up questions to the person. Um, what would you? What did you learn from that situation? How would you, um, uh, who did you get on your team to participate? So um, a couple examples of how you would probe um, is like, for example, if someone said, we, we worked on the handbook, we processed the changes one at a time. One of my probing questions would be, who's we? And, and then when they say, oh, okay, well, we was me and a board member. And then I had a teacher on the committee and a parent. Who was in charge of leading the task would be a question. What role did you play? So I'm going to ask those we's. Um, I'm also going to ask questions if someone tells me, for example, something, um, and I and I, I I feel like I don't know the whole story. I'm going to keep asking questions um, to kind of until I get the full onion unpeeled. So, for example, I had a teacher um, that was uh, laid off a couple of times, um, didn't really probe. Um, I I didn't ask, but when she said she was laid off. Um, she, I'm going to ask, well, did they replace you after, after you left? Then I maybe know she wasn't really laid off. They maybe just, it wasn't a good fit for her. Um, I might ask, um, here's an example. Um, I asked a, uh, manager once that was coming, uh, in corporate America and they were coming from Walmart and they said to me that they had left their previous employer because of a policy violation. And so my probing question would to keep at, well, what was the policy? Well, it was just, you know, it was just one of their policies for customer service. And I, you know, it's not relevant here. And I said, okay, well, well tell me what it is. Cause we just want to make sure it's a good fit. So you're being really nice. You just tell me more, tell me more. Well, um, it wasn't a problem before. Oh, so this was your first incident. Yes. Yes. It was my first incident. So, okay, well tell me what it is. And then that manager told me they followed someone out into the parking lot and they slapped someone. So that was why they were let go. Um, so you, if they tell you an answer and you're not quite get, just be really nice and keep asking those probing questions like, who is we? What role did you play? Um, another example would be um, I had an employee once that told me they came up with um, a solution to a problem that they were working at at work and they and they kept saying the we we did this we did that and from probing we found out that when they said we their manager actually initiated the changes and they kind of just helped implement it, which is fine if I don't need them to be the problem solver, but um, you're going to keep asking those questions. So some probing questions are, tell me more about that. What did you learn from that? What did other people say about that? What happened next? How did it work out? What role specifically did you do? How do you know it was successful? So you're just going to keep asking questions to you really understand the situation. It's good to have just a handful of questions and you know really, really well and a whole bunch of questions that are hypothetical and maybe you don't know so well. Okay. So with that example I shared with the administrator, probing questions would be, you know, why was the handbook maybe um, older than a year old? What was the budget? How do they know what they um, delivered was accurate? Um, did they, um, was the board satisfied? How do they know the board was satisfied? So those would be some examples of probing questions with that administrator example. We are, I'm gonna go through this next section a little quickly because I wanna be able to give you guys some time for some questions. There are two resource. Um, there are three resources. Sorry that the I'm going to share with the district for you on behavioral based interviewing. The first one um, is a candidate evaluation form, and the um, second one is an actual interview packet. So you don't have to recreate the wheel. You can just change out the questions if you want. Um, but basically, you'll ask behavioral based interview questions, and you can write them in the star format. 
And then after you um, have an interview, there's a rating sheet where you can kind of, as the uh, calling, uh, not sorry, not a calling committee, the hiring committee, you can rate each candidate on how they did based on their technical qualifications, work experience, communication, motivational fit. And then you can use those assessment sheets to compare candidates, which is really helpful, especially when you don't have um, interviews back to back that kind of can trigger your memory. The third component besides the interview packet and the candidate evaluation form will be a bank of questions. And the question bank is over 75 questions that I've worked with hundreds of different administrators in um, within the LCMS and also a lot of outside the LCMS, like uh, Catholic and Nandana. And it's their favorite questions that they have asked for um, hiring administrator or teacher positions. And so it's specific for um, education. And all of those have already been written in a behavioral based format. So you don't have to think about that. And so that it will be another um, deliverable for you, too, that you can pick and choose questions or if you're if you're not sure what you want to utilize. A couple of jolts when you're hiring, just some best practice. Um, when you have a candidate's application or resume, make sure you make copies of it and that you're not writing on the original. You do have to retain um, the application materials for candidates um, uh, for some time. I think, I think it's two years in education, but I can double check for you all. Um, so you want to make sure that if you are ever challenged, you're not making those notes on the originals, that you have a clean copy for the originals. Um, I don't recommend you have social security numbers on your application. The reason being is if you're printing that and sharing it, the social security number should be protected. And so that's just really easy to take off. And then you don't have to worry if it's sitting out on a desk. Um, be careful when you are asking for information. Um, this is this is assuming you're hiring lay people and you're not hiring commission ministers, which is the case more and more often but that you're, um, you're not writing anything that's a protected class unless it is something that would be uh, qualified under a bona fide occupational qualification or the religious exemption. So that would be okay, but you don't want to write stuff like born in China or um, you know, uh, pregnant, wants more kids. You don't want to write stuff like that down on their applications. Um, you do want to make sure for the dues that are best practice, pre-screen your candidate Train your interview question on your interview teams on what are legal questions, especially when you have um, calling committees or hiring committees that maybe some of them have never interviewed and they think they're making small talk. And that's when some of those illegal questions come up and they don't intend to do it, but it gives the candidate an impression that that is the reason why they're um, not being selected for a position. And sometimes it is um, uh, going to cause a problem if they're if they're going to challenge that. Um, I give the every single person that is doing the interview should have a copy of the resume or the interview packet so they can take their own notes. That way, if one of you are talking, they're able to capture and each one of you will capture different things. And you can each kind of see like they gave me this part of the star, but not part of the other. And then that way you're tag teaming to ask questions when you have that person um, coming into interview. Um, keep in mind, you do have to retain your hiring documentation. Um, you should send decline letters, but you don't have to tell people the reason why they're a decline. And I don't recommend that you do. You don't have to get specific. You can just say you went with another candidate. And then um, when you do do a, um, a, a job offer, make sure that um, it says that it's contingent upon the successful completion of a background and or drug test. Um, maybe some of you are not all doing drug tests, but with vulnerable populations, I'd assume you're all going to do a background check. So just make sure you have that listed in the offer letter itself. Um, a couple other things that a lot of our employers um, fail to do is um, provide Fair Credit Reporting Act summaries to candidates. If you're going to do a background check, you are legally required to provide these summaries to your candidates. Um, I don't think it hit Minnesota, but a couple years back, there were people applying for places in Wisconsin and purposely just trying to catch them like a gotcha when they didn't give them those FCRA um, notices and then they were suing employers. It was kind of a uh, like nuisance claims, but it was just kind of a pain in the butt. So just make sure you're doing that. If you're using a background check vendor, they usually will supply you with those. So just they're called FCRA, Fair Credit Reporting Act. That's something I see a lot of ministries miss. Um, the candidate should be filling out paperwork to do a background check, notice an authorization form. If you have a vendor, usually they'll help you with that. 
Um, and then if there's a candidate reference check authorization form, if you don't have one of those, that's for if you want to call the references, sometimes ministries will have them fill that out. Um, a couple other things that um, I would just mention on here is um, it, when you have employees who are departing, some you can um, choose to put in their file um, that they sign a release um, and in their file in case anyone calls to check on them for a reference. And so that's actually if your employees departing, uh, you can always um, do that as well. So this is just a full list of different things that some employers will think about from the hiring perspective. Um, to circle back to that example that I had at the beginning, um, there were a lot of red flags with that employer. Um, they didn't do a pre-screen. They just had the person come in and interview. The the They didn't have a lot of interviewing notes, but the people who interviewed were not people who interviewed on a regular basis. They hadn't had any formal training. They weren't used to interviewing. Um, the ministry did not follow up on red flags. They did one reference check with just one employer and the reference wouldn't tell them a lot of information, just dates of employment. And so they didn't really know if they could push and ask some of those questions of why that candidate had left so many times. In, re in hindsight, they would have did that differently. They would have really kind of pushed and asked and, and um, kind of did the gut check on why is that person leaving so many different jobs. Um, they were short staffed. Um, they were in a panic to make quick decisions. It actually cost this min this ministry this um, a lot of time and energy, um, probably some reputational damage. They did end up losing a few families um, and then um, and then trying to attract you had to get them out and then find a, find a new teacher that could take over for the rest of the school year. So that was very difficult for them. They ended up giving the person a package so that they would um, leave and um, so then they needed to pay some legal fees to be able to, to, to draft that in the state that they were in. Um, and then um, the other thing is that they just should just maybe practice and think about the questions when they did go into the interview. They didn't have anything prepared. They didn't have anything structured for the skill for the skill set or the competencies they were looking for. And so from one candidate to another, they didn't even end up asking the same questions and didn't have any documentation. So they just didn't have that structure. So um, that was a lot of learnings for that ministry. And I hope that that can help you avoid that um, in the future. Any bad bad hires. We have just a few minutes of time. I know I talked very quickly. It's a lot of information to share in a webinar right after lunch, but I can open it up for questions if anybody has any. I have a question. Tim Berner here from Concordia Academy. Am I coming through? Yeah, you are. Yep, we hear you, Tim. What do you... Uh, do you have any thoughts or recommendations as far as using personality surveys and some of the diagnostic tools that uh, for testing of personalities to complement what you're looking for? Yeah, um, I would be very careful if you do personality testing. Um, a lot of them are not validated. So are you it, saying like disk inventories, Tim, that sort of thing? Yeah, there's there's all kinds of different ones that could be mm -hmm. used, but yeah. Yeah, I'll, I, the other thing I would look for besides uh, how do they know they're valid, like how do they really know that what they're testing for is really going to tell you what your candidate's about? The other thing I would look for is what's called disparate impact, um, just so that you're not getting yourself in a, um, a pickle with discrimination. Because sometimes people of certain... Uh, protected classes uh, don't do well in some of those compared to other demographics, and some employers get in trouble with that. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing that I would see from, from ministries is to have the, the administrator or someone who knows what they're doing do the pre-screening. Um, with the call committees I've been on, people feel like they attract to like the personality or something resonates with the person and they don't listen to the examples. They're not trained or they don't interview with like their day-to-day -day jobs. And a lot of people don't interview often. So that's why if you structure the interview and you prep those people ahead of time, like here's our interview packet, here's the questions we can pick for, you'll go into the interview a little bit better versus, oh my gosh, you know, we connected, they had a really good personality. Yeah, they had a really good personality, but they've also been, you know, like let go and keep switching jobs. And, you know, like there's some red, there's some pretty significant red flags. And if there are red flags, I, I think a maybe is a no between you and me. Like if it was for my ministry and if I can't figure out the answer of why they have those red flags, it's a no. 
or you just keep probing. You keep asking those follow-up questions. And I'm always super nice. Like, I want to make sure it's a good fit for that person too. I don't want them to say they're leaving an employer and they don't like it and they're coming here and they don't like it here. I want to make sure it's a really good fit for them as well. So I just am very nice about it and just keep, at, you know, tell me more about it. Or, you know, I really want to make sure that we don't also have that such a, you know, situation here. So, you know, let, let tell me, what didn't you like about that employer? What didn't you like about that leader? Because if they say, you know, the leader was, you know, super micromanaging and I'm micromanaging, I'm not by the way, but if I, I was, then I would want them to maybe know that. And maybe then they don't want to work for me. So those are some other things that I would kind of watch for. Um, the other thing too, is sometimes I'll have people ask about, um, like when they call to check references, um, what can you ask? You, you can ask a lot of things, but most places are very afraid to tell you things. So sometimes you have to read between the lines, like, um, you know, what was your start date? What was the end date? What was the position held? I, sometimes I'll ask, um, were they re are they rehire eligible? Um, most employers will tell you that if they are, if, if they aren't, um, if I, sometimes you can ask the employer, um, what was the, um, the reason for separation? I like sometimes they'll share you those information. So, um, I ask those types of questions as well. Um, if you are a employer that is being asked to provide a reference for someone that left, um, you generally can share all those information like start date, end date. This is, you know, the position they held, that kind of thing. Um, if you have a situation where there was misconduct, uh, then I would recommend you talk to an attorney because sometimes there's risk for the ministry not sharing that information. So that's kind of a tangent, but I get asked a lot. Sean, any other questions? You're on mute. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but I do have a question. My name is yep. Bethany. Hi, Bethany. Um, do you have a good list of the illegal questions that would be a good review for with myself and our call committee? Um, I, yeah, I could probably put a list together. I, I probably can't think of every single thing, but, um, I'll, I'll answer it quick high level here, and then I will provide it to the district some examples, but, um, it's the, it's like protected class stuff where you're asking about like, where were they born? Um, you know, are, are you married? Are you, do you intend to get married? Are you going to have kids? Um, there's a way to ask, like, if they have a disability, like, can you complete this job with or without accommodation versus, I, you know, like, I notice you, you know, are in a wheelchair, you know what I mean? Like, like, is that permanent? Like, you would just, you would want to be really careful with anything in a protected class. Um, like, how long do you want to work before you retire? Um, so, like, your protected class, I should say, is, like, um, your race, gender, um, religion, although we can hire for preferential, you know, because we're a church, um, which by the way, your job description should have some information about how like that's critical for your mission that they're sharing the faith. Um, disability status, age is one. If someone's over 40, that's why I say like, don't like, oh, how many more years till you retire? Because sometimes it feels like it's conversational or like, oh, you look pregnant. When are you due? And you don't mean anything by it. And then all of a sudden they don't get the job and it's like, cause I'm pregnant. Well, it, no, it's because you were fired five times, but you know, like it's whatever that candidate says. So it's basically those protected class types questions. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, I know that was a very fast crash course on behavioral-based interviewing. When you see the packets, it'll help to make sense. And if you have questions or um, I'll even say this, my contact information um, was on the slide. It's really easy. It's just Beth that Jones at Concordia Plans. But if you get to the point where you are interviewing, you're like, hey, could you look at this? Or if it's something really quick, I'd be happy to help you too. Beth, that was phenomenal. Thank you so much. Wonderful information. Um, we will be sending out the additional information you're providing, as well as links to this recording and the previous recording um, very soon in the next couple of days. So 
thank you. And uh, thank you all for participating. Um, and uh, God bless you all. And success, we wish you and pray for your success in filling those positions. All right. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.